Hi everyone, and welcome to the Argo CD and Rollouts community meeting. Uh, I'm, I'll be your host today. My name is Jesse Suen, and I work for Intuit. And I, uh, currently, I've been working mostly on the uh, Argo Rollouts project recently. Okay, so, um, so today we have a couple of things. Let me start sharing the agenda. Um, I was hoping to get um, Ed uh, to talk about uh, a move that we're uh, proposing to move from the corporate CLA to um, the developer certificate of origin. Um, that was just a, a quick announcement, but generally um, the idea is that uh, this is most CNCF projects are actually on this, but it implies that you will have to sign all your commits uh, when you're contributing to uh, the project. And there's a, um, uh, we'll have a bot that is essentially just checking, uh, similar to the CLA bot, uh, making sure that all your uh, commits are signed. Uh, and by signing a commit, uh, Git has a flag um, that just indicates that you're signing off on your commit. Um, and the bot will basically just check to make sure it has that, um, that signed off on, uh, as part of the pull request. Um, okay, so uh, today we have a special guest, uh, Matthew Clark from Spotify, uh, and he will be talking about how um, they're currently um, using Argo rollouts at Spotify. Uh, Matthew, are you ready to share? Yep, I can start presenting now. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Can you see the laser pointer as well? Just want to check. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, cool. There it goes. There it goes. I can see it. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, some introduction. Uh, I'm Matthew Clark. Matt is fine. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Spotify. And I work on the team that's responsible for deploying all of our backend uh, services. Um, I originally gave this talk at the CNCF end user SIG on uh, September 17th. And Jesse asked me to give it here as well. Um, whoops. So it's just going to be going into a bit of detail about how we're using Argo rollouts and some learnings we had from it and, um, and where we kind of see it going in the future for us. Um, so to start it off, I'll just talk a bit about Spotify um, and engineering at Spotify. So we have a pretty general like DevOps structure being you build it, you run it. Um, we don't really have like an SRE team or anything like that. We generally build tools so that teams can do their own uh, operations as well as development. So like I say, we build common infrastructure, builds deployments, and people use that common infrastructure um, to not have to repeat all those tasks. Um, we use GitOps pretty heavily. So generally when things deploy to master, they go to production. Um, there are some exceptions and various things around that, but that's generally the way things are done. Um, we have kind of two deployment strategies in the past. Uh, this rolling update, which is just your pretty standard Kubernetes uh, deploy or um, our Helios, our, our legacy uh, containerization service, or orchestration service. Um, and the other option was a manual canary, which was basically we would take one instance of the service um, and then we would deploy it as well. And then the user has is responsible for going to look at metrics and logs and decide whether that uh, canary is successful or not. And the whole success of that is, is totally up to them. We don't provide anything really. Um, so we thought about our deployment strategies here and, and what we might like to provide in the future. And this is kind of the infrastructure we have. 
uh, tugboat is our kind of um, facade for our deployment uh, because we can go down either of these two lines like you can have uh, services that are still on Helios um, and then uh, new, generally newer but there are a lot of services now on GKE um, we deploy with Spinnaker and we use a, an in-house tool called Compass which uh, allocates uh, services to specific clusters and then every time we want to go look up details about that service we go to Compass first to ask where it is and um, so this lets us kind of handle multi-cluster deployments you can deploy to multiple regions as well um, so that's uh, a general overview of how our deployment architecture works um, like I said we we looked at our deployment strategies we had and they weren't very advanced and we were thinking about adding something um, and we had he we heard a lot about automated canary analysis. I'm sure all of you know what it is as you're here. Um, so yeah, being a progressive deployment strategy, deploy a small amount of a new release, uh, then direct small amount of live traffic towards it. I run a check to see that it's working as intended, and then increase the amount of traffic going to the new release, roll out more of the new release, and basically just repeat the process until it is the new stable, it is the new thing that's rolled out. So we thought about why we need ACA and some of the things that our users came to us and asked us for. Um, limiting the blast radius of potential bugs to a small amount of traffic was a big, big uh, feature request for us. So normally if they did a, a deploy and uh, they, it wasn't something that would be caught by a smoke test, um, the potential for a large blast radius um, could be really bad. And then you are obviously having to revert that and that taking time in itself. Uh, so we wanted to think about how we could limit that blast radius from an infrastructure perspective. Um, we wanted to improve the quality of releases and um, to actually like maybe put some checks behind it to showing that, yeah, this release had the following checks, that the following analysis performed on it. Um, automated rollbacks was another thing that we really wanted um, for users to kind of just not worry about that on manual canaries. They had to manually roll back if they decided that it wasn't correct. Um, and we wanted it to be completely automated. We wanted it to be uh, like declarative. We wanted it to be pretty hands off and pe people trusted that it would just work. Um, so we looked into this, we had a couple of choices. And one thing that obviously came up was Kayenta because we were already using Spinnaker. Um, some things we found about it was that the config was very complicated and didn't seem to be customizable for our use case. Uh, we kind of thought that there would be a lot of work to integrate this and there was no easy way for us to integrate this with Heroic. Uh, Heroic is our time series database that we use for all our metrics. Um, we had the idea to just custom build a whole bunch of functionality on top of Tugboat to take care of this. It was already our facade so we thought maybe we could just uh, do it there. Um, the problem was that we thought we weren't really utilizing open source and that's really something that we're trying to do as, as much as possible. Um, and when we looked at a service like Flagger, the problem for us was that you need to have a service mesh and we don't have, a, we don't really use service mesh right now. Um, but when we saw Argo Rollites, that was very promising for us. So in an overview uh, of it, I'm sure you all know what it is, but I'm gonna explain it again. Uh, a controller runs on each cluster and orchestrates uh, canary rollouts. And instead of a Kubernetes deployment, uh, you put a CRD, which is called a rollout. Uh, that's what you actually deploy to the Kubernetes cluster. And users can define their own canary steps through a bunch of sequential steps. You can see an example here on the right. And there's three different types of steps. You can have set wait, which decides how much traffic goes to the canary. You can have pause to wait a defined period of time. Or you can have the analysis step, which is where you judge whether the canary is successful or not. Uh, and we'll talk about analysis runs in a second. So you can see those examples here. We're set, setting weight, 33% of traffic to the canary, pause for five minutes, and then run our template here, which is called acceptance test. And this is a kind of sneak preview to the UI that we've added into uh, Backstage that I'll go into in, in a minute. Uh, so when all the steps are done, the deployment is considered successful and then that release is considered the new stable. Uh, around traffic management, um, so uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, that set wait command, when you deploy it initially, no traffic goes to the canary, 
had to start off, you actually have to tell it, you know, I, I want this amount of traffic to go to the canary. You can see an example of that here. Uh, because we don't use the service mesh, this is how it works for us. Uh, we have a certain number of pods in the replica set. So this example is 10. Um, set weight is zero. There's no uh, canary pods uh, at the minute. We set the set weight to 25% and it will round up. Oops. It will round up. So we now have uh, 30%. So 30% of traffic goes to the canary replica set and the remaining 70% goes to the stable version. So you can get much more fine grain traffic management with Istio and any SMI uh, service mesh or, or even the Nginx and AWS ALB ingress controllers. Uh, in terms of analysis, users define these analysis templates. Um, every time I click the zoom, the laser pointer disappears. Uh, add, and they can add them uh, as analysis steps in their canary. Um, so the controller will turn these into analysis runs. Um, so an analysis run, uh, if it passes or fails, will determine whether the canary is successful or not. And you can get uh, lots of different types of uh, analysis runs. You can have a Kubernetes job. Um, a, you can have a call Prometheus. You can do a HTTP GET to what another system if you have that. Or you can talk to Cayente running in standalone mode. Um, at Spotify, we're using Kubernetes jobs extensively uh, where a pass is when the exit code zero is returned and a fail is where the exit code one is returned. You can see what kind of happens here. The Argo Ruler controller creates our analysis run job and it goes out to Heroic, our time series database and, and, runs a, <clears throat> and runs a query against that. And so users will define their query and they'll define their threshold. And if that threshold is broken, then the deploy fails. And this is the sort of thing that users will define. They'll define a metric and then in here, the job um, and then the spec and the container to run. So this would be our analysis job that we run. Cool. One problem that we have with analysis templates when we were first looking into Argo Rollouts is that we came up with a bunch of analysis templates and we put them up on our documentation website. Um, and our initial users had some problems with that, which is that it's easy to make a mistake when you're copy pasting. And we even actually accidentally put a mistake into the docs and then people copy pasted that mistake everywhere which was a bit of a pain when we discovered it. So we wanted to get kind of get rid of those sort of things coming up um, as well as it being quite verbose, like just this part here is what the user is defining. All the rest of this is, um, is copy pasted really. Uh, so users had a lot of this manifest boilerplate in the repo and we wanted to reduce that. Uh, we also wanted to keep that tugboat abstraction uh, and not necessarily let users know that we were using Argo Rolex for canaries. Um, so we didn't necessarily want them to deal with analysis templates themselves. Um, in order to improve this in the developer experience here, we contributed back this idea of cluster analysis templates, which are cluster wide analysis templates. Uh, and that allows us to centralize those analysis templates into a repo that my team are responsible for. So what, what we do there is we provide these cluster analysis templates and then users can just uh, say that the template they're using is cluster scope uh, and they can use those cluster analysis templates that we provide. And so we can, this makes a much easier onboarding experience for users because the analysis templates are already there. They don't have to go create them and they can just add some arguments and put some overrides in if necessary. Um, and this actually turns it around so that users only have to change one file in their Git repo in order to get uh, ACA, which is really nice. Um, and by centralizing those analysis templates, we can make sure that they conform to best practices and keep them up to date if a metric changes or if uh, they need to filter on something else. That sort of thing happens. Uh, how do we integrate it with Tugboat? So for regular deployments, uh, Tugboat relies on Spinnaker manifest stabilization. Um, and this looks at the Kubernetes components that Spinnaker is deploying, and then it has internal logic to decide whether the, that deploy is done. But for Argo Rollouts, we, uh, we couldn't rely on that because it doesn't know about the uh, when to consider uh, a rollout done. Uh, and rather than do that through Spinnaker, we actually added that into Tugboat. 
Um, so Tugboat will check the status of rollouts at an interval. Um, and if all canaries in all of our clusters pass, the deployment is successful. So like I said, users can deploy to multiple clusters. So we can end up running like multiple canaries in different regions in different clusters at the same time. If one of those canaries fails, rather than users being on different versions for different clusters, we revert the entire thing. So we have a, uh, a kind of ACA synchronization layer, which is orchestrated by Tugboat and it, it stores the clusters that they're in and the status that they're in. Um, sorry. Uh, so this is about the integration with Backstage. And if you don't know what Backstage is, I would encourage you to go look at it because it's a very cool project. Um, Backstage is a portal for uh, kind of developer UIs that is pretty abstract. You can kind of uh, make it kind of look at anything. Users that are developers at Spotify use Backstage to view their deployment progress and much more. Um, so this is an example of what a developer will see whenever a deployment is ongoing. You can see that we're deploying to this Asia East cluster now. We're deploying to this uh, European, Euro, uh, Europe West one cluster, and they're all happening in parallel orchestrated by Tugboat like we saw. And we transform the Argo Relite steps uh, into the this nice stepper so that users can see what step they're on and it kind of progresses as we're going. Um, and then we will highlight the analysis runs here uh, like providing links to the Kubernetes job logs and that sort of thing, and just highlight uh, if we see any failures, then this will turn red uh, and the whole thing will abort. So we have also added in the ability to skip canaries because sometimes users need to kind of just take executive control and say, I don't care if this has been a regression in performance, I need to deploy this because it has an emergency fix in it and we'll fix the regression later. And um, so we, we give users that power to just skip all the rollouts and that just integrates with uh, Argo rollout skip functionality through Tugboat. Uh, so yeah, one thing we wanted to do was we wanted to hide the implementation because we wanted to, it to be really easy for users to configure their ACA experience. Um, we wanted them to be able to turn it on or off with one change to one file. Um, so all of our, uh, a lot of our infrastructure is declarative. So we have a declarative deployment file in the repo. You can basically just toggle on or off whether you're gonna use ACA and put your steps in there. Um, we didn't want our users to have to learn the ins and outs of Argo rule lights. Um, we kind of experienced that with Kubernetes and we wanted to hide some of that from them. Uh, so we only expose users to canary rule light steps. And if they need it, analysis templates, if they wanna create their own custom ones, that we don't have cluster analysis template versions of. So everything else, including the Argo, or including the rollout CRD is hidden from our users. Uh, Tugboat will actually, when you do a deployment, it will take the deployment, and if it sees that they've enabled um, ACA, then it will turn that into a rollout. It will just mutate the manifest and deploy that instead. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of little tweaks you have to make in a couple of different places to make that possible changing any HPAs they have to have a scale ref target to a rollout instead of a deployment, you have to do that. Um, yeah, um, and we also added in functionality to migrate users because if you, if you mutate a deployment into a rollout, but you've already got a deployment, then you will have a deployment and a rollout at the same time. So we have migration logic in there that once the deployment's out, then we can get rid of the deployment. Or it, once the rollout's in, sorry, we can get rid of the deployment. And the, re the reverse is also true. Um, so if they turn ACA off, then once the deployment is in, we turn the rollout off, take the rollout out. So some things that we've learned from this is that there's no real tool that does everything. Um, you'll have to do some part of it, unfortunately. Um, and the big thing for us uh, that we found was the tough part with managing an ACA tool uh, for users is not necessarily the, inf uh, the the actual tool itself and the infrastructure for performing an automated canary uh, deployment. It's how do users uh, easily configure their analysis and use the metrics that they care about and how do they integrate with existing monitoring configuration to make that happen and can you make it declarative and if it is declarative then can you provide tooling so that they can validate their configuration is correct locally 
so that they don't have to go into a deploy, oh, that didn't work, deploy again with some true config, that didn't work cycle, which can be, can take a lot of time. Um, so yeah, uh, another thing is we have a basic ACA configuration that anyone can use, uh, but the ability to customize it. So like I said, we have, cluster, whoops, we have cluster analysis templates that have a bunch of um, things that people can use straight out of the box. And if they really want, they can configure their own analysis templates with the metrics that they care about. So yeah, uh, in the future, things that we are really looking forward to, I think Jesse is gonna talk about this, is the ability to tag pods as canary versus stable. And this is because we wanna do relative comparisons uh, for metrics. Uh, at the minute, users have to say, fail if the latency is above a second on average, but we wanna be able to say, fail if the canary is 20% higher latency than the stable or something like that. Uh, we want to provide more local tools from users. We want to kind of look into, like I've said, uh, making it easier for users to configure their ACAs and further Spotify tooling integration. And then some things that are coming in the far future for us would be better traffic management, maybe integrating a service mesh with AC, our ACA tool, possibly integration with Kyanta um, and supporting blue green deployment. Cool. Uh, that's it. Um, I have some time if anyone wants to ask any questions. Just stick them in chat. I'll try and see if I can get working. Uh, so Omer <coughs> had a question uh, from chat. He's asking, do you also use Argo CD? We don't use Argo CD. Um, so that is mainly because we use Backstage. Uh, for everything um, and we have another team who is responsible for uh, for our builds and um, it just didn't really seem, seem like the right tool for us but Argo Rollouts was I think. Oh, okay any other questions for Matt? Oh, um, we have one question from Rio. Uh, how far along is the adoption and how long have you been at it? So I think the, we're not at the stage of judging adoption in percentages yet. Um, I think we have probably around 30 teams who have at least tried it, which is pretty good. Um, I'm kind of hoping that we can go GA internally uh, soon, and then that will increase adoption, and then we can consider um, turning it on by default for users if that's possible, if, if users want that. Um, because when users create uh, uh, new repos in Spotify, they clone from a master template. So we could get, like theoretically turn it on by default and then see where we go from there. We haven't really talked about that though. Okay, any other questions? From Hey, Matthew, uh, great job. So I have a question about the Spotify infrastructure a little bit. Just like wondering like how many Kubernetes cluster you guys have and how big is the cluster? How big of those clusters? Yeah, I don't know if I can really answer those questions. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to, to be honest, sorry. Okay. Um, I will look into it and uh, I can respond on Slack. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, so if there's any other questions, just feel free to, um, to at me in the Argo Rolex channel. Um, uh, I'm usually pretty active in there. All right. Uh, thanks again, Matthew. I, I know you have to drop off now, but, um, but yeah, thanks again for, um, for uh, taking time to present to us. I know it's also uh, late for you. Uh, it's all right. Uh, it's half six. But, uh, <laughs> all right. See you all. Bye. Thanks. Uh, okay. Looks like we have Ed back, and then uh, he can cover the um, the CLA to DCO um, uh, decision that we're proposing in the Bootstrap committee. Uh, hey. Let me share my screen here. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, so um, since now that uh, the Argo project is part of the CMCF, uh, we wanted to update our, uh, you know, contributor licensing agreement uh, or DCO uh, in order to kind of uh, better follow CMCF guidelines. So, and the CMCF actually allows projects to use either, uh, but uh, I think the but about like 80, 90% of projects use the DCO, which is kind of a simpler, lighter weight version. So let me just show you the DCO here. So, uh, the CI, of course, is kind of a long-ish document, it discusses things like intellectual property rights and stuff like that, uh, which of course is needed to ensure that like users of the Argo project are you know, guaranteed that, provide some guarantee that uh, you know, they have to write to use not only the source code, but any, uh, you know, patents or intellectual property associated with the source code. The DCO provides a, you know, very similar level of protection. Uh, the Linux kernel actually uses it as well, as well as, you know, I was mentioning like 80 or 90% of CNC projects. It's a much shorter document. The DCO stands for Developer Certificate of Origin. And it basically uh, mainly says, you know, that, you know, I have the right to contribute this work to this project uh, that is cons you know, in con uh, that is consistent with the open source license that the project is using. In the case of Argo, that would be the Apache 2.0 license. And also that, uh, you know, I understand that we will be keeping a record of my sign off, you know, it's, uh, recording my agreement to contribute this work. So that's basically what the DCO says. Uh, from a Kind of day-to-day -day operational perspective, it means that uh, all commits should have a sign-off tag, which you know, very conveniently can be generated simply by running commit with a dash as as flag. So, so most developers should already be, I think, very familiar with it. So, basically, instead of just doing git commit, you know, blah blah blah, you would do git commit dash s, you know, blah blah blah. So, any uh, any comments or thoughts? Okay, great. I mean, I think this will be, so, so we'll probably enable the DCO, we'll, we'll replace the CLA webhook with the DCO webhook. And, but you could, you know, immediately now start doing commits with dash S. So all contributors should just start using commit dash S to sign off on your commits and everything else should be automated. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question oh, okay. from Rio uh, from chat. Um, Rio, did you want to? Oh, it says, how would this protect against rebases? Um, rebases of? You mean if someone like copies, uh, redistributes uh, code, code from the Argo project? Oh, it says, wouldn't it overwrite the commit message? Um, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, the commit, uh, this just adds a signed off colon uh, to the end of your commit message. Yeah, I think the, the dash S option is really just a convenience to add that text to every, to your message. You're good. Exactly. You can also manually add this, but obviously it's easy to mistype it, so. You know, most people just do commit dash s, and then it takes care of everything for you. I know that uh, Argo, all Argo repos are configured to squash commits. So basically, even if we get a PR and it has five commits, and then we merge, we ended up having one commit. So does it mean like every approver, whoever merges, need to make sure to keep this sign off by? Uh, no. In a, uh, Yes, you should. When you, when if you are uh, editing the merge commit message, you should make mm -hmm. sure that you know you, you preserve the signed off mm -hmm. by you know, colon. Yeah. yeah. There has to be only one of them, though, so you could delete all the extra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other okay. questions? So, so overall, a much more streamlined experience. Like this is obviously much easier to read than a CLA. CLA is like two or three pages. Okay, great. Uh, 
So yeah, so just please just start using commit dash s for all your commits. Uh, you're probably already doing this for other projects you're contributing to. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, hi, this is Jack Boy from Hi. It looks like there's also a, a, a git uh, config setting, uh, so you can just have this happen by default. You don't have to remember to set dash s. Oh, okay, that's great. Uh, there you go. Then you just need to edit the. So we'll update the read uh, our project readme with those options, uh, and then uh, probably in a couple of weeks we'll enable the hook so that if you forget like to do the commit dash s or include the sign off, then the bot will remind you. Thank you for that tip. That's great. Okay. okay. Over to you, Jesse. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Okay. Next on the agenda. Um, so um, another topic that we've been uh, discussing in the uh, the new Bootstrap meeting um, uh, is community membership. Um, so before we uh, had the very rough um, membership guidelines um, and it wasn't clear um, what it took to become, say, a member or re reviewer or approver. Uh, and so, um, so we formalized this in a um, uh, document. And this, this is currently in review to the Argo Proj Argo Proj um, uh, repo. So, uh, and right now we're, we're asking for uh, soliciting feedback from the community about this. Uh, so this is largely adapted from the Kubernetes um, membership guidelines as well as an open telemetry is also um, uh, a pretty much the community membership, uh, Kubernetes community membership guidelines with, with uh, some uh, modifications. Uh, so ours is, is kind of similar. Uh, we, in, in summary, we have four roles, uh, just like uh, Kubernetes. We, the, the first three are named exactly the same. Um, and then instead of, I think Kubernetes might use the word maintainer or owner, uh, but uh, we chose to use the word lead. Um, and what this document is outlining is essentially uh, the requirements of becoming uh, um, like achieving membership reviewer approver roles, um, as well as the expectations of responsibilities and privileges. Um, again, these, these are mostly the same as um, in the Kubernetes and open telemetry, although we tweaked some of the requirements. So such a, like Kubernetes, I think requires things like uh, I think a longer duration of membership. Um, they require more um, uh, code uh, PRs to submit, and um, and also for Argo project, we um, we added some more responsibility about uh, things like being able to triage uh, PRs and and kind of more in community interaction uh, engagement. So we could, we're trying to promote uh, more. Uh, members to to engage with the community and get and so we have uh, pr uh, promote the Argo uh, project community. Um, so I'm not going to actually go through this in detail, but um, I'll just link to this in the um, uh, agenda and and ask for people's feedback as we um, work on uh, merging this proposal. And. Right now, I'll stop for questions. Let me look at the chat. Um, um, okay, any questions so far on the Argo Project Community Membership Guidelines? Uh, oh, one thing I forgot to point out is um, uh, the the rules are per. Um, Per project, so I mean, obviously, for a member like when you're a member of Argo Project, you would be um, a member of the Argo Project organization. Um, uh, but to for an approver um, and leads and reviewers, there uh, they would be per project. Okay, so. 
Um, and then next on the agenda, if, and please feel free to add things if uh, the topics that you want to discuss after this. But um, next, really quick, I was going to um, solicit feedback on a Argo rollouts feature that um, is coming in 0 0.10 uh, about adding ephemeral labels and annotations to Canary and Stable uh, pods. Um, so just an overview about the feature. Um, currently, um, when you're trying to, the, to measure metrics against your um, Canary or Sable, we don't have a stable label like that you can apply to, okay, this is the, can, these are all the pods that are the Canary and these are all the pods that are the, the Sable. Um, and the reason we don't have that is because they can only carry the, the labels and metadata of the replica set. Um, uh, and that is always changing. Like it's every revision that you deploy, there's, a, there's just uh, different labels and uh, annotations. And so what this feature is doing is that um, during the course of an update, uh, the rollouts controller will actually uh, mutate the pod labels uh, such that only the pods which are acting as the role of a canary will be labeled in a, in a certain way that you define. Um, and, all, and the stable pods will also be labeled in, um, in the way that you define. And then the, once the rollout is complete, since those pods change meaning, like the, this, what was once the canary pods are now acting in the role of the stable version, uh, the controller will go and mutate the um, those pods labels and annotations to um, to to denote that they are say the, the now the stable and the reason this is useful is that uh, without this feature it's hard to come up with just static queries let's say in, in datadog or prometheus that just can chart you uh, the the stable versus canary um, uh, metrics uh, because we, we don't currently have any way to uh, do that. We give you the ability to, to query based on the pod rollout pod template hash, which is a hash of the spec, but that's not, you can't have a, um, a static query uh, that is that because that's always changing. Okay, so that's the background about this feature. Um, so the syntax, uh, the, right now I have a work in progress PR um, and I just was, this is the syntax that I was proposing for um, um, achieving this feature. And uh, just requesting for anyone who is interested in this feature, if uh, they would, it would satisfy their use case. Um, so the idea is that there's two new um, fields inside under the Canary strategy, basically stable metadata and Canary metadata. And then the, those you simply specify annotations and labels uh, which you would like to apply to the either the canary set of pods or the stable set of pods. Um, and that's that's it for the feature. Um, I think pretty soon this I'll make this available in the image that people can test out. Uh, one of the big questions that I had when developing this uh, this feature is that uh, changes to labels after the fact, after a pod starts. Um, I was concerned that sometimes the the collectors or whatever um, metric collectors are, are are scraping those things maybe aren't um, detecting those changes after the fact, after they um, they start. Because I know for things like you know, like environment variables or something. Um, you can't you can't change the environment variable after the fact, or, or if you change annotations and you and you downward API mount that to um, a pod, um, it's up to an application to actually recognize changes to those annotations um, later. It, the the so something has to watch that file and then say, oh, okay, the some the annotations change, and then maybe do some updates. So there's still some questions on, um, um, okay, even if we mutate the the labels and annotations after the fact, will tools still be able to recognize this? And I did verify at least with Prometheus operator that um, the changing labels of pods are reflected in the metrics that the, the operator uh, is scraping. I think it's like just cube state metrics is, is scraping. 
Um, okay, so that's this. Um, I know there's not too many rollout users in the, the channel right now, but um, uh, for people watching on the recording, uh, yeah, this is your time to kind of uh, give some feedback and then um, shape the way that this looks. All right. Um, okay, so we've actually come to the end of our um, uh, agenda items. And so at this point in time, I'd like to kind of open it up to uh, the floor to see if anyone had any other topics that they'd like to discuss. Okay, um, let's check the chat. Looks like we, there's no questions on chat. So um, unless there's anything else, we can end a little bit early. Hey, this is Subash. I have a quick, uh, um, I mean, a couple of questions. Okay. Make it quick. Um, so when we are talking about the uh, metrics collector, um, is there a way we can add the git commit id that is getting merged and the author into the um, metrics collector the, the reason i ask is that um, at the end of the day when i show the dashboard or the met metrics right i see um, that the application sync um, in the dashboard but i don't see the details of the commit id and the um, author of the uh, sync, which I'm getting in the sync history of the application, right? And I go to you, command line. You're referring to, um, you, you're referring to Argo CD, right? When, yeah, Argo CD. When, uh, so this information, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. And so you would like for these metrics to appear, um, appear where? To be, to be collected by the uh, uh, Prometheus so that I can view it in my Grafana dashboard. Oh, I see. Um, so so um, what I'll say is that we do need to be extremely careful about um, what we emit as metrics in, in Prometheus. And this is just in general, um, because the the more variation that you have with the metric, uh, it affects the cardinality of the, that, that metric. So um, things that are constantly changing, which would be true with say get commit hashes, every commit hash, um, basically increases that cardinality of that, that series. Um, and so, uh, and the, the reason this is a problem is that Prometheus has to, um, I think in memory has to um, um, index on these different um, values of the of the metric, and so if if we are exploding the cardinality of the uh, metric, it actually will cause Prometheus memory usage to to increase by uh, exponentially. Um, so there's different metrics that where this might be possible for like a status, uh, a status type of um, metric, I believe it might be possible to at least report the current um, commit. Um, yeah, so I, I think we would have to look into how it affected, but some, some Prometheus uh, metrics are affected by cardinality and, and then others may not be. Um, so, so why, I, I would suggest to file an issue uh, for it and then okay. um, discuss it. But sure, yeah, sure. the main concern I would have is about increasing cardinality of that series. Okay. Uh, Jesse, uh, okay. I can maybe share how we solve this. So okay. yeah, the cardinality thing uh, is definitely an issue, but because um, you're using Grafana, you can actually use the Argo CD hooks to uh, make a call into Grafana to make an annotation. And uh, on that annotation, you can add loads of uh, information that's already 
uh, either injected by Argo or you can pull it out from, from the Git repo itself. And the extra nice thing about that is that you get these nice vertical lines on graphs on when something, for example, failed to deploy or sync um, or uh, if syncs are uh, uh, OK. Oh, wow. OK. I didn't know that about uh, so you're So Grafana is able to kind of merge information, uh, one coming from, say, Prometheus metrics, and then two coming from, say, webhook events to Grafana. Is that? Yeah. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, um, uh, vertical alert lines sometimes. In, uh, yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're the same thing. You just have to uh, uh, tell uh, Grafana to pull it out of uh, annotations. I think it's what they're called. And it's uh, it's really just a, a, a normal webhook curl call with okay. an API token. Yeah. Uh, someone, so there is a, a Argo notification project, which is in Argo Labs, and someone contributed example of that. Uh, at least, you know, you don't have to use Argo notifications, but you can copy paste this curl command. Uh, yeah, that's actually, uh, I forgot, that's actually exactly what we use. We use the Argo notifications project uh, uh, to send these uh, things. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So that means. Oh, cool. So Argo notifications can uh, contribute some data to the Prometheus, and we scrape the data. I mean, um, Grafana gets that from Prome the same Prometheus, or are we talking about completely two different data sources and uh, merging the data at a later point of time in Grafana. So Prometheus isn't involved in this process. So you actually post uh, to Grafana directly and it stores it inside of its database. Uh, it's probably possible to also do that with uh, Prometheus in some sh uh, form or shape, but Prometheus's uh, data store is simply not optimized to do, um, uh, to receive data like this. Okay. Okay, thank you. This, um... Is this what the, where, uh, you guys are doing? Mm -hmm. OK. Yep, that's it. Yep. OK, so it looks like um, if you visit Argo CD notifications project, and then this is the Grafana documentation, it looks like uh, this is a way you can actually um, get these markers inside the um, uh, Grafana dashboard. That, that's cool. Actually, I didn't know about this. OK. We'll take a look into that. Uh, OK, so we have a question from Rami in the chat. This is, it seems like Kubernetes etcd has a file size limit of one megabyte. How do we maintain Argo CD RBAC config if it grows more than one megabyte due to hundreds of uh, projects? Um, so one question I would have. Um, so, so projects actually have their own um, um, RBAC. And so we, we actually have thousands of projects, uh, one, uh, one project per service. Um, and and we, in, in our I think, um, environment, we actually map, uh, one, we map the project to um, in uh, ORDC group so that only members of that service or like developers of that service have the ability to, um, to, to affect the applications in that project, like sync it, delete it, uh, edit the, the application. Um, so all of this is actually um, configured in the, and stored in the um, application project CRD. Uh, so if you're adding things like roles, like like okay, the I'm this let's say, pretend this is like an admin role, and they can do star on everything in the default project. Um, so we would, when when you click update, this would store that inside the project and not the um, the central con, uh, config map. And I I doubt that you would have enough content and roles in a, in a project level to fill up one megabyte. Um, and I guess, is that something you would be able to do, uh, Rami? Uh, <clears throat> uh, actually, <clears throat> sorry, for each application, right? Uh, we have uh, around, uh, I think, uh, 
maybe uh, 10 to 12 lines in that RBAC config map for like uh, editor, viewer, and uh, mm-hmm. admin uh, with different like uh, access applications, get update for editor and for admin, all star and uh, viewer, something uh, for uh, uh, with get access. So let's say if we have uh, maybe hundreds or close to thousand uh, projects or apps. So for each app, we'll add like at least uh, 12 to 13 lines in that RBAC config map. Uh, so obviously that file will grow, right? Um, right now it in KBs, but if it grows like, until or after 1 MB, Right. So, so my question was that um, RBAC can actually be configured um, not only from the, the central Argo CD um, config map, but it can be configured inside, in, inside the project, which is, would be distributed uh, across your 100 uh, projects. So you mentioned you have a 10 lines uh, per project. Why wouldn't those, pro- uh, those 10 lines be contained um, like in, in here? And I, I just, I wanted to add to it. I know that this is not really documented, so it might be the reason, you know, you're not aware of it, I mean, but basically the same RBAC configurations, you know, which you are describing, it can be replicated in Project CRD. And JC is showing you UI, and that UI, you know, you can use it to configure RBAC rules in Project CRD, and you can do the same declaratively, you know, in just if you create Project CRD manually. Uh, okay, so actually we are using the RBAC uh, to open shift uh, config map. Yeah, that is, I mean, you can, uh, like imagine if in your RBAC, I imagine you have uh, a mapping between OIDC group and bunch of rules. So you can have exact same configuration here. So right now, Jesse is showing you this field where you can put your OIDC group from uh, OpenShift and then mm-hmm. policy rules. That UI is just a wrapper for the same type of rules, you know, which you configure uh, in normal RBAC configuration. So, and here you can define this like 10 lines where you can say users of that IDC group can sync or you know, yeah. whatever rules you have. So I could like, if this is um, okay. my, my group, I would then bind um, members of this OIDC group to this role in this project. The, the only reason I would suggest people to use the, um, the centralized config map uh, art back uh, is when you need to span, like you need a user to, um, or credentials to kind of span multiple projects. So we, uh, because, Everything I put in here um, will only be scoped to the applications in this project. It's called default. Uh, so if you need to span, if you need some uh, thing to kind of uh, like a service account to do things across all projects, uh, then that at that point I would use the Argo CD config map or RBAC config map. Otherwise, uh, I recommend. Um, uh, containing it per project because it's, it's just more manageable this way too. Okay, so in this case, uh, only this group we have to mention in the tar back, right? That uh, that gives access whatever we have defined here and under the policy rules. Uh, that's that's right. Like if you notice here when we're selecting, okay, um, let's pretend I'm adding star privileges. Um, all of these things are only for the default project. And I think if, even if I tried to, to change it, I think this should block, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not even logged in. But um, it, we, sh- we would disallow this role being able to um, access across projects. So these roles that you see from the UI are, are scoped to only the applications in, in whatever project is in this project. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions? We have about a two two minutes. I'm happy to stick around too.
Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for attending this week's uh, community meeting. Um, next in two weeks will be the workflow and events. Um, all right. Thanks everyone.